Hi everyone, my name is Jeffrey. I'm a PhD student at the National University of Singapore, and I'm very, very honored and very happy to be here to share with you some of the technologies that we're uh, developing at the Mixed Reality Lab in the National University of Singapore. So before I jump into my talk, um, I just want to position yourself because I'm going to show you some technologies that actually might seem um, kind of silly. Actually, you don't really, we don't even know actually how uh, we could possibly use them as products in the future, but we are still inspired by them and we still strive to develop them. And what I'm going to show you is, could possibly be what we believe um, will be how you and your children communicate in the future, how the next million, one billion people will interact with each other over long distances in the future. So, the world is increasingly becoming connected. Technologies such as GPS can tell us where we are in relation to one another. And mobile communications and the internet allow us to transfer data over wide distances at a dizzying rate. We've become masters of voice and video communication. Um, we can talk to each other using video and voice. But actually, we, our technologies and our current communication methods are seriously lacking in terms of teleporting something such as emotion. How do we communicate in ways that are more natural to us? Um, how can we communicate using all our senses, not just voice and video? So currently in the interactive and digital media research field, we are seeing a paradigm shift. We're seeing a change of how we develop and use communication technologies. Um, things like logical and verbal communication and information sharing are quickly changing into something that we like to call feeling communication or nonverbal communication. In a sense, really experience sharing, not just the sharing of information. So in the past, and maybe a little bit in the present, sharing of information was our main way to communicate. But very soon, and maybe we're even in it now, and very much so in the future, the sharing of experiences will be our main way of communicating and our main reason to communicate. So at the Mixed Reality Lab, what we try to look at is we try to look at how we can actually engage all our senses over the network. Um, in a sense, when we lived in very close communi communities and when we communicated to each other, um, we were engaged in different modalities uh, you could hear me, you could see me, but maybe you could even smell me, smell how excited I was about a, su a subject, for instance. You could read my body language. There would be a transfer of, there would be a change of temperature because of our heat. All of these things, all these modalities of how we communicate actually factor into us successfully communicating to each other more than just information, but also emotions and feelings and experiences. So some of the projects that I'll briefly touch upon before going into uh, my own project you can see here on the left, uh, this person is wearing a project uh, that we call Huggy Pajama. And what Huggy Pajama attempts to do is um, essentially attempts to facilitate hugs over the internet. Um, I know this seems a little bit silly at first, but if you think about um, when you, let's say you travel quite a bit and you don't get to see your children so often, and once in a while you Skype with your child, uh, tell them bedtime stories, and they can see you and they can hear you, but imagine you could contextualize that communication by actually physically reaching out and touching them. Imagine you could tell them a bedtime story and hug them at the same time. That's essentially what we're attempting with the Huggy Pajama Project. How can we add a haptic layer, a feeling layer, to our current modalities of communication? Similarly, on the bottom right, um, you can see something, another project which we call Poultry Internet. Now, poultry internet is similar to Huggy Pichama in the sense that um, we're looking for ways that we can haptically interact with our pets over the internet. Now, you might wonder why we chose a chicken. Well, actually, in Southeast Asia, um, the chicken is um, it's a household pet, actually. It's, it's very friendly to us. Um, and in fact, um, chickens are highly intelligent. Um, there's a lot of research that's gone into showing that chickens actually produce more eggs um, when you haptically stimulate them. So, in fact, you see in these chicken farms, you see these kind of hands that pet chickens once in a while. And just through this simple act of touching, they're able to produce more eggs. Um, so that's another reason why we 
decided to make this project also because of maybe a little bit of guilt about how we treat chickens already in society. Um, why not create a way that we can actually reach out and hug them and touch them over the internet? And then finally, at the top right-hand corner is a very, very new... Um, this picture represents a very, very new field of interest in terms of what we want to research at the lab, and that's smell and taste communication. Now, um, I can't give you too much details because we still haven't published anything yet, but essentially what we try to do with smell and taste communication is we attempt to teleport sensations of flavor across wide distances. Now, what you see here is our first food teleportation machine. So if you can imagine um, two of these food printers in two different locations, and you wanted to, say, wish your grandmother a happy birthday. Now, you could just send her a card, like you do every year, but what if you could actually send her your own personally designed edible cake, which they could receive on the other end? Now, imagine... Now, what this printer does is it prints in layers, so in layers of different flavor and in, of different color. So, actually, as you eat, as the person experiencing your communication, as they eat your communication, um, stories are actually revealed in a narrative format as you're eating the layers upon layers. Um, we do other things, uh, we experiment in other ways, such as um, uh, electrostimulation of the tongue and also magnetic uh, stimulation of certain parts of the brain, but I won't actually go into that right now. But you can imagine it's kind of weird science. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what I'm personally um, involved with, um, and we have a very nice team working together on this, is how we can actually change the way computers feel, how we interact with computers, how the feeling of interacting with a computer uh, can be totally changed. So what you see here is um, uh, something that we like to call liquid interface because we couldn't think of a better name before this presentation. Um, but what you see here is actually a, way, a new way that we can interact with machines using the morphable uh, qualities of liquid. Liquid changes shape depending on its container. Um, and we think that this is a new way that we can interact with computers. But I'll, I'll explain a little bit about where we're coming from in the next slide. So, if you look at the history of the way we interact with machines, um, it all, all comes down to how we developed the button. So, up until the 1900s, we were using levers. Levers were a very important way that humans interacted with machines. We see this in the printing press, and we see this in classical organs, um, and we also see it in popular culture, such as when Dr. Frankenstein pulls this huge lever in order to bring his monster to life. So about after the 1900s, we began using the button. And what the button essentially is, is actually just a little lever that's very easily pressed. Um, it seems uh, kind of trivial and ubiquitous, but actually the, the button has made a significant, significant contribution on how we interact with machines. We find it on every object, on keyboards, on mice, on this clicker. And culturally, the button kind of speaks for itself, if you can see some of the images. But actually, um, up recently, from about five, ten years ago, um, there's been a great push and a great acceptance of something that we call surface computing. Now, surface computing can be found on things such as the iPhone and the iPad. And essentially what this is, is it's a button again, but this button uh, can be animated with computer animations. It can change its context depending on how you want to use it and what it's used for. And this has made a significant step in how we use technology, because this button now can, can be anything. What's lacking in this button, though, is that um, it still changes and animates only on a two-dimensional surface. It doesn't animate on a 3D surface in a physical and tangible way. It's totally virtual on a surface. So what we believe the future of the button, uh, we believe the future of the button will have fluid properties. It will actually be, in fact, made from liquid. So what you're seeing here is a video of our first prototype, uh, which combines electromagnets, ferrofluid, and multi-touch technology. And what we're able to do here is we're able to um, sense touch on a two-dimensional surface in a multi-touch format and actuate our buttons in a three-dimensional space by manipulating electromagnetic fields. Um, yeah. But we found that this, actu this methodology actually was a little bit messy. Um, we, we, didn't actually, we didn't really have so much um, idea on how we could use liquids as um, a method of interaction because there hasn't really been so much work done on that. 
um, which also makes it a very exciting research field for us. So what we decided to do instead was um, use something uh, called the Hall effect, which very easily essentially senses the density of a magnetic field. And we were able to no longer have to touch the liquid, but we could actually manipulate the liquid just by waving our hands over over the liquid, and it's almost magical in the sense where you, know, you, can pu you can imagine pulling buttons, pulling shapes out of the liquid, um, and actuating the, the computer, the machine, whatever you're using, um, actuated simply by these physical gestures. And what's nice about this as well is that we've, because in our previous prototype, we only had two-dimensional sensing with multi-touch layer, but now we have a three-dimensional sensing because we can actually de uh, sense depth up to six centimeters. So the button can be pressed in increments depending on how far you are from the surface. So that's very exciting for us. We just, we just finished this, um, did some experiments just a couple weeks ago. So our, our goal for the future is to essentially um, change the way we use tangible user interfaces. Tangible user interface is any interface that has uh, physical qualities. Um, most of these are solid. We think that there is a wealth of research to be looked into, into morphable and liquid tangible user interfaces. And, you know, we kind of envision, it's kind of been envisioned about 10, 20 years ago through films such as The Abyss and Terminator. Um, it's kind of our inspiration, not necessarily our motivation. We would like our product to be <laughs> a little bit more useful, but that's essentially um, where we believe our technology will, will bring us to. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs>